for coming everyone we really appreciate you slogging out we're a little bit off the main drag but very near all the good coffee shops so I think yeah. that makes up for it um, this is the first of the Socialist Health Association fringe meetings there is a, another one this afternoon um, just after 2 30 so please do if you uh, are still about do come back and talk to that we'll be looking specifically at um, privatization and fighting back against privatization um, there um, for some of you, you might, how many of you have heard of the SHA? A few. Has anyone, has anyone wandered in and gone, who, who the hell are these lot? Is there? There's a few. Good. Hello. Welcome. We're very happy to see you. Um, you'll all be aware of the history of the um, socialist societies. There's a, um, a, a handful of societies initially that started in various um, areas of industry and of civic life that were, just, that were founded to support the Labour Party and to inform into the Labour Party from their particular industries. They work a little differently from unions. They were often made of professionals or charitable groups who had a real interest in one area. And they used to be very well respected by the Labour Party and the Labour movement. Many of those socialist societies still exist, and there's a little amalgamation of socialist societies. The SHA, the Socialist Health Association, is one of the oldest and biggest of those socialist societies. We've been around a long time. We're made up of several thousand members. And what makes our membership particularly um, exciting and interesting is there's an awful lot of health and social care professionals in there. We've got people who are leaders of, of NHS trusts. We have consultants and surgeons and doctors and nurses and physios and social workers and uh, the whole spectrum across the, the health and social care um, network. There's a lot of professionals there. And at various times in history, the SHA has directly and regularly briefed the shadow cab health cabinet minister or the, the health minister on those times that we were in government. As you would imagine, according to the politics of the day, the influence of the socialist society has ebbed and flowed, depending on which Labour administration is um, in position. Make of that what you will. We're not going to talk about that today. Uh, well, I'm not. The panellists can do what they want, of course. Um, so if you haven't heard of the SHA and you have a particular interest in health or social care, do look us up online. Please do join us. There are T-shirts out in the lobby, which I understand are, are they free? They are free. We, you're asking. Yeah, they're free, but you have to wear them and we will hunt you down. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll be monitoring that. Um, but you are, of course, welcome to make a donation. If you feel bad about that, you can give us 60 quid a T-shirt and we'd be equally happy with that as well. Um, so we will have Richard Bergen MP joining us. Um, he's coming directly, as you would expect, event to event to event today. So he will slide in at some point and, and join us. He's been a great friend of the SHA. Um, we also have uh, Jabu here. Jabu um, Nala Hartley is one of our Oxford City Councillors who um, is very passionate about health and social care. I will give her a better introduction before she speaks. Um, and our, our first speaker is um, Andrea, who again I will introduce properly in a moment um, from Unison, um, who will be um, sharing lots of good stuff with us as well. Um, a brief context of the NHS and social care situation that we are in, which you're, many of you will be aware of. How many people are aware of the health and social care bill that went through last year? Good. Um, you can tell the SHA members, hey, yes, <laughs> with, with feeling. Um, that puts private healthcare providers actually on the commissioning boards. Um, so the, the rooms where they sit around a table and decide how public money, our money, is being divvied up um, and how much of that is going to the private sector, there are now um, lobbyists from healthcare companies in those panels, on those boards, making those decisions. And some of them are not from the UK. They're actually US big 
health insurance conglomerates mm -hmm. literally flying in to sit on a local authority board and, and put their influence. And when that passed, I think a lot of us thought, well, that's it, it's game over for the NHS. And legislatively, it's pretty grim just mm -hmm. now. You know, we'd be lying if we said it wasn't really grim. But there are other things that are happening along the side. And one of the things that is happening is the unions are kicking ass at the minute. So lots of the unions are fighting outsourcing contracts by taking it directly to the courts. And this year we've had high court wins. Um, and it's, as you would expect, it's our young scrappy unions, not necessarily the big ones that led the charge on this. But, but the, the big ones are now catching up. Um, so we had three high court wins this year where um, they're all based in London, where you hear the, the, the you know, people on the picket line, there's industrial action of porters or security staff or outsourced um, hospital workers, and they're, they're taking industrial in action because their terms and conditions are shocking. Um, and they're doing a bloody good job. And alongside that, what the unions did was then take the trust, the commissioning trust to court, and that they did this written in a really interesting way. One of the things that COVID really showed, and I know Jabu's going to talk to this in, in much more authority than me, is the disproportionate impact on insecure workers when it came to the, their health and their well-being. And with COVID, that meant deaths. It didn't mean they're being paid an hour less, a, a, a pound less an hour. It meant they were significantly, in some cases, double more likely to die or be left you know long term infirm from covid and the public got that for the first time so what the unions did was said well we know this we know that insecure contracts um, disproportionately impact black and minority communities we know that people on those contracts um, are more at risk from health inequalities and more at risk from from insecure contracts from from um, long term long term problems because of those contracts. Covid has thrown that into the into light. And if you as an employer directly um, or a commissioner know that something you do is going to disproportionately impact one community, then that's discrimination. It's indirect discrimination if you don't know. As soon as you know, it's direct <coughs> discrimination. So the unions have started taking um, hospital trusts to court, and they have won three battles in a row. Um, and all of those contracts have been immediately taken back in-house. And what's very exciting about that is those hospitals are now looking at all their other contracts, like, oh, we're vulnerable here, and they're starting to bring them back. So whilst our parliaments on both sides, one might argue, are not particularly helpful, at the moment in terms of protecting our health and social care the unions are stepping up so there'll be a heavy union focus today and that is deliberate that is not accidental it's because that's where the front line is um, uh, so you've heard enough from me you get to hear from our panelists now um, so I'll introduce Andrea Egan to you Andrea Egan is the uh, newly elected Unison president uh, although she has not new to Unison or the trade union movement um, she has 30 years experience in local government um, and including a lot of fighting about outsourcing contracts so mm -hmm. I'm sure um, we'll hear about that. Um, I will let her speak to her emphasis because she'll, you know, she'll know that better than me but I just wanted to read one quote that I found of yours that I thought was particularly good um, and she says, I use every power and opportunity I've got and I won't leave any equality group behind. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that sounds like a good place to start. So over to you, Andrea. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you for the invitation today. Um, I am a local government worker. Uh, as you've said, I've actually worked for over 34 years for the same council. Uh, I'm currently a social worker at Bolton Council, but I'm a member of Unison. Uh, it's a public sector union and while it covers many sectors, the police and justice and energy, um, our biggest uh, membership is in health and local government. Um, our biggest sector is the local government sector with over 650,000 members in local government. Um, as I've been introduced, I have been, I've been elected onto the NEC for the last six years, but I'm now currently uh, the national president, uh, and I am here speaking in a personal capacity. Uh, we've recently, I'm on a ticket of uh, a manifesto of change, and we won the majority last June. So uh, there's quite a lot of work that we're doing at the moment. 
to, to look at ensuring our union becomes an organising union and not a servicing union. So there's a lot of work going on in the background. There's a lot of battles, but we're getting there. Uh, what I wanted to talk about today, as I said, we, and we've got 400,000 members in the health service, but uh, I wanted to talk today on my perspective about local government and I'm uh, being a local government um, branch secretary, but my seat on the NEC is actually the female local government seat, so I felt it was right that I tried to give a perspective on social care. So I want to talk about our care workers. And I would say, even back in the day when I first started working in the council, uh, social uh, care assistants were, um, when I started in 1980, um, uh, uh, the care assistants were one of the lowest paid grades really within the structures. Uh, and I started my working life in a care home as a care assistant. Uh, and I would say that my role was really defined we had seniors, we'd got a deputy manager and an officer in charge. But I, and I knew what my role was and the chain of command and it was clear. I was there to care for the residents. I would get them up, I'd get them ready for the day, I'd feed them, I'd sit with them, I'd take them to the toilet, I'd get them ready for bed. And I started back in the day when social care and social work were all provided, all provided by the local council. Uh, but the, the majority of these workers were in a public sector union mm -hmm. and the pay and the conditions were protected under collective bargaining. And I think that's an important element as, a, as I go through um, some of the changes that we've seen. And I've seen many changes, service changes, over the last years, but especially, especially over the last 12 years uh, with the Tories' austerity programme. Seeing services to the most vulnerable in our society, either caught or outsourced or ceased. Uh, and I have fought so many battles, more battles than I can care to remember with my local authority, which uh, was uh, a Labour council. And the thing that has always struck me as a local government worker is my members have often been seen as the poor relations to those opposed to those working the health service. Uh, the Cinderella of the family. And that's the reality of it. What we've experienced in local government, though, is truly a race to the bottom in our terms and conditions. And over the years, the professionalism and the terms and conditions and pay have all been eroded. Most of our care homes have been outsourced to arm's length companies, which then create two tier workforces. Uh, and that's workers doing the same job in the same home but on different pain conditions and care provision commissioned by the council to the ever expanding private care <coughs> companies. And I really feel that we're in a real profiteering crisis in this country mm -hmm. at the moment. We'll talk about the Health and Social Care Act and the main purpose of the act was to establish a legislatively a framework that supports collaboration and partnership working to integrate services for patients. And among a wide range of other measures, the Act also includes targeted changes to public health, social care, and the oversight of quality and safety. And that sounds great, doesn't it? Stop the bed blocking in hospitals, get patients home, or into a care provision rather than an hospital bed with the oversight of quality and safety. But the sad reality is that the workers in the social care settings are still amongst the lowest paid, but the picture's far bleaker than it has ever been before. And as I mentioned, the council's arm length arrangements means it operates a two-tier workforce. And those staff who, who did 2 over don't now get even a pay rise as either those in the council, so they don't get a pay rise, so when we're negotiating on the NJC uh, each year, that because of the Heron, Pat Heron case, they don't now get the right to the same pay rise. And when we try to negotiate a pay rise for them, uh, the, the bosses think that they're already well enough paid, uh, opposed to the lower paid, the second tier part of the workforce and it is a real battle. And, and I have to say that it's only very recently, 
you know, the air campaigning has been the same, but it's only very recently that those two PID workers are now getting angry and are prepared to take on the bosses. Um, but, and as I said, the seen as having superior uh, terms and conditions to the new workers, who incidentally don't get paid for the first three days on sick. They have less annual leave and they've got a really crap pension scheme. Um, and what, we, what we've seen over the creation of the arm's length companies is the turnover of staff. And so that is an arm's length company that the council, it's an arm's length company from the council. I have always argued, the branch has always argued that that is the first step onto privatisation. That the council don't agree with that. But ironically, the situation is, if there's ever an issue or a dispute and we go back to the council and councillors to say you need to sort it out, they say, oh, it's not out. There's a CEO in that company, it's nothing to do with them. But recently, when I went to the council to challenge them on the ethnicity uh, and the ethnic, pay gap, uh, ethnic gap uh, in employed members and the higher uh, members, uh, ranking managers, uh, the first person they quoted at me was the black CEO of the arm's length company that they often don't want anything to do with. We had, they had got one black um, officer, which was an absolute, you know, it's, uh, and they got called out for it, but it's, you know, it's just shameful. Mm -hmm. And the sad reality is that um, Unison, so sorry, so Unison's do also organise, you know, we've had to put up with, years of these services being, uh, if you like, outsourced. Uh, and we have fought them, but they're very clever in what they do. The biggest one was the arm's length, but they knew that the workers were uh, ageing profile. And what they did is they said to those workers, look, we'll give you like a redundancy package. And that package were worth nearly £30,000 to most of those workers. And what they offered is, but you'll still have a job but on the worst terms and conditions. And the real sad um, issue with that battle was the members turned on us as a branch because they said, you're, you're our union and you're stopping us from getting that, those. You're trying to pause. We can get nearly £30,000. And we just could not convince them that that 30, it was so short-sighted. And what is really sad is most of those workers that did two pay have now left. And the ones that are still working, as I said, they left not only with the real no pay offers, but, you know, they go on sick and they've worked for the council. So then really feel that difference. But we do also organise as a union in the private sector. Uh, in, in, and that, I have to say, the picture is even bleaker. Workers are often on zero hour contracts really poor pay terms and conditions, worse than those working in local supermarkets. And the bosses of the care companies treating the staff with little dignity, often imposing extra costs on the workers for the DBS checks or the uniform and placing responsibilities way beyond the pay grades with staff, often administrating medication, providing complex peg feeding care and providing complex care packages and train, training is often lacking. Overwork is expected without pay and being called in on the last minute to cover the fragile workforce. And when you're on either zero or a contract to part-time hours, you're desperate for the money. So the work-life balance is a luxury to most. Our use of agency staff um, at a time, no continuity of care for the patients or to support the established workforce as some of the shift is spent spending uh, time, you know, trying to bring the agency staff up to speed with the day-to-day -day procedures. So let us not forget the new health and social care with oversight of quality and safety. And COVID shone a light on the care staff. Uh, but even then, we saw the attitude towards them by the public, treating them differently. During COVID, health workers got discounts at all kinds of places, but the care workers, what they got were really crap poor PPE uh, and were sent patients who had COVID to spread the disease uh, and the virus amongst the already vulnerable group of residents. So staff often found themselves stuck in a home as staff fell ill around them, unable to come into work. And it was the most shocking and darkest days in our care history. They are the forgotten, 
or overlooked heroes. And Unison does organise, as I said, in the private sector, but it is also so difficult because we find representing members marks the cards. Or when you've managed to organise in one of the homes, care homes, it suddenly takes a turn. You get a steward that steps up to the plate, we get them mentored and supported, and then they leave to go to another job. So Unison has for some years been seeking the councils to sign up to Unison's Ethical Care Charter and one of the asks is that the council seeks that the care companies who work is commissioned from the council pay the foundation living wage to the staff. But we've only managed to interest some councils to sign up to a watered down AIMS 2. But there is hope and I'm going to end it on all of this. Greater Manchester Care Workers won the Living Wage Foundation's prestigious Living Wage campaign. Uh, after coming together to secure the Foundation Living Wage across uh, six councils. And, you know, I were really pleased that what my council, which is now a Tory council, uh, through our lobbying, mm -hmm. were one of the six original uh, first ones to sign up. Um, but that certainly puts shame on the other Labour councils, doesn't it, that didn't out of the ten other local authorities. Uh, the Unison-led campaign titled Greater Manchester Co Workers Demand a Pay Rise, it was targeted at Greater Manchester Councils to pressure them to provide the foundation living wage to all directly employed and commissioned social co, uh, social co workers. Uh, and it was launched in 21, and, and as I said, it was successful in six out of the ten. Uh, councils last year, Manchester, Salford, Oldham, Stockport and Bolton councils coming in in 2022. So they have seen a pay rise for 25,000 hard-working co-workers transferring approximately 19 million directly into their pockets over the next year. Um, and it was really good because the campaigners uh, received an award presented by the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, for the Living Wage Foundations. And the award was a recognition for the hundreds of care workers across Greater Manchester who've come together uh, in unison to build that public campaign supported by thousands of workers. But it was also arguing that care workers had gone above and beyond during the pandemic to care for our loved ones. But now face the cost of living crisis as wages aren't keeping up with the cost of food, housing, petrol, gas, electricity and other basic essentials. Um, as I said, many have made the commitment to the foundation living wage, but many providers are actually now provide, uh, refusing to pass the money on to, to the frontline staff. So we've got another battle on our hands. So Unison argues that that foundation living wage needs to be made an essential contractual requirement of all commissioning and where providers refuse councils need to take whatever action is necessary to, in, uh, to agree that the care workers receive that decent pay including looking at options to bring services back in-house. Uh, I just want to tell you about Medaline, a provider of supported living services commissioned by Manchester Council, City Council. It's told its staff it has declined the offer of additional funding from the council to pay the foundation living wage on the basis that it cannot do so on a commercially substantial footing. Now, despite Medical, uh, Medline's claims it can't afford a pay rise for its staff, the company reported an operating profit of 2.1 million in 2020 to 21, and it represents an increase in profit in the previous years of over 150,000, uh, 150%. So it is an absolute outrage that some providers are prioritising their own profit above the welfare and dignity of staff and the people that they care for. And our campaign will continue. But I think just to round that up, uh, you know, we've got our health co workers, OCS, here in the North West. Uh, OCS hospitals that the porters and the cleaners that are actually taking their bosses on at the moment they've they're out in their third week of strike action and it was only suspended during the official 12 days of mourning but I think bringing them all together you know what what it just feels we have got a profit, profiteering crisis and all that energy that is being spent on all those individual care homes and those individual hospitals fighting for the basic rights of workers, both on paying the terms and conditions, 
would far be better served somewhere else. And, and that's really the campaign has to be a joined up campaign mm -hmm. across the unions to bring these services back in house and stop this private profiteering crisis. Thank yeah. you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Welcome, Richard. Uh, the, the gentleman with the camera will want to mic you up in a moment, so um, if you could bimble in that direction, that would be great. Um, that was Question. great and really good, really good to hear. Um, I think that the um, help, that the link between health and social care is something that people are increasingly understanding, mm -hmm. I think. Um, um, the the uh, motions that have passed on the National Care Service over the last few years have been really encouraging. Okay. Um, and one of the things that has really, um, really struck me is I know I've come from the healthcare, mm. like the NHS background. So I was an intensive care nurse for a long time. Mm. I've worked at um, policy level within acute care trusts. Mm. And I think in nursing and in and frontline staff in the healthcare system, there is a, a really kind of strong belief about that they should be integrated, that they should be the same mm. thing. Um, and often from social care, they fought very hard for a separate social care, a national service, but a separate one. Mm. Um, and I remember sitting down and thrashing this out about three conferences ago. That I, or was it the really windy one in Brighton? Was that three ones, no, three conferences yeah. ago? Yeah. I think so. And, and they made the point um, really, really passionately about how um, social care is always treated as the Cinderella. Mm -hmm. You know, the budget is you're, it's always less. And part of that is our, our own prejudice around mm -hmm. ageing, isn't it? And our own fear of ageing, if you take it from a psychological mm -hmm. perspective. But what they said is if the, if the NHS and social care budgets were integrated together, if we got everything we wanted, where it was all brought back in house, it was all publicly owned, publicly provided, mm -hmm. publicly funded, and they were together, that dynamic would still play out. Because when your budget is stretched yeah. and you've got the world leading heart transplant guy saying, but we need four million for this yeah. state of the art equipment, which will make us world leading. Yeah. And they're saying, well, we need money for our yoga class, for our, for our care home. Mm. They're all, the, the care home yeah. service is always going to lose out. It's always mm. going to be paired back. And, and that was a real challenge to me as a healthcare professional, because I'd mm. spent 20 years saying, they should be integrated. It makes no sense that yeah. they're not integrated. But actually, that those budgets all really do need to be separate. And it's why it's so important that the, or why campaigners campaign so strongly that mm. the National Care Service should be publicly owned, publicly funded, publicly provided, but separate, a separate ring fence budget to, mm. to protect. Um, and we know, you know, the, the, uh, the, the gap between, the, the connection between um, the winter, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, winter pressures on our NHS and the social care provision is, they're intrinsically linked, aren't they? Welcome, I'm glad you made it. Um, would you like a moment to settle or shall I just dump you straight into it. What, how are you uh, feeling? I'm very interested in hearing what you've got to say. Uh, well, I'm the chair, so I'm going to okay. shut up in a minute. Because, Give um, me 10 seconds, if that's OK. I, I, I think it goes a little bit yeah. further as well. I mean, I said earlier at the start of my speech that I'm a social worker, but I'm actually a social worker in children's services. So yeah. I started working in an in a adult, uh, a adult as a care assistant. But I think even now it's shocking that there's even a difference between children's social work and adult social work mm -hmm. and social care. I went through the ranks that I went from uh, adult care provision to children's homes first before I went into social work. And, you know, when you have an injury or a death of a young person, then mm -hmm. there's a public inquiry. You know, every, everything is thrown at that inquiry. But if there's an injury or a death in a care home, yeah. it's expected. Yeah. There's not quite that same focus, and there's not, and, I, and that's the important thing about, you know, our attitude to older people, mm. um, and, and whether, uh, and we're all going to get there, aren't we? We're all going to need that care at some point in our lives, hopefully, that we'll live long enough to, uh, to, to, um, to get that care. But I think, uh, you know, as right now I look down that that line and think. You know, oh my goodness, what yeah. I hope to goodness I ever ne never need that care provision because if we can't change things now, what is that provision? The stories our members tell us when they ring mm. because they want some support or they want some advice or we're going to organising. Some of the stories that they tell us about the care, the lack of care, and that isn't because of the lack of love or compassion of those workers, that's due to short, being short staffed. Mm. Not having enough staff 
on duty to provide that quality care across that unit. Um, having, I talked about unpaid overtime, you know, our, our care workers having to, are due to go off at 10 o'clock and the agency staff don't turn out, up. So they're left for half an hour, an hour, waiting for the agency staff to turn, turn up. So that's unpaid work for them. Mm. Um, unless, until we challenge it, but that, and if they're not in a union, they just take it on the chin and... Uh, so there's so much, mm -hmm. and there's so much to join up that there should be equality in all the care provision that yeah. we provide. And that be, when I say equality, I mean across, whether you're from social care funding or, or the health service. And in Bolton, we've got two care homes, the only two care homes that we've got left but they are the halfway house between when you've discharged from hospital. And again, you know, we have one of the homes that has got a sister and it's an integrated care service in that home. Um, and it, it's, got, it's half made up with health staff and half with uh, council staff. And one run, is run by your sister. And then the other care home, and they both have the same provision to get in from a discharge from hospital, is run by a care manager from the council, but it has health staff and social care, care staff in from the council. And it's a nightmare mm -hmm. because the sister wants to run her unit on health, her health terms and conditions, but her and book, and the NH and the council uh, run uh, one. But they're all, they're all owned by the council, just one's got a sister and one's got... So even that basic provision, mm -hmm. we can't get that right. And that is a real worry for me as we start really trying to get this integration up and running because mm. we could say, oh, we've got two examples here that should be exemplary that we should be able to say, oh, that's something we can build on. Mm. And these have been in existence for the last 10 years. We haven't even got those right. Mm. So that is a real challenge for us. Uh, so I think rather than personally, rather than the energies of keep trying to fight those individual, the bigger fight should be about getting them back in house yeah. so that they can be properly managed, properly, you know, have the quality control and those staff can be given the proper training in the terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. Better trained staff provides better provision and better yeah. um, numbers of staff gives you uh, continuity of care for your, for your users and for yourself as a worker, yeah. feeling safer on shift. Yeah, and I think you used a, f a phrase there that I think is really important about joining the dots. Mm. And I think if there's one thing for this, these two sessions, I'd really like to, everyone to feel when they go out is mm. that we've joined the dots together. Yeah. You know, it's really easy to see the crisis in the social care mm. setting as just funding and, and just, just beds. And it's easy to see the crisis in the NHS as underfunding and wait lists, mm. you know, not being able to get a GP appointment. Mm. But actually the workers' rights crisis mm. is underpinning all of that, mm. isn't it? The, yeah. But um, those statistics came out two weeks ago that the NHS now has an average vacancy rate of 30% across all sectors. That's from yeah. cardiac surgeon to porter oh, God, to yeah. cleaner to nurses. Yeah. Um, and, and I you know, experienced that myself. I was in mm -hmm. critical care nursing. Mm -hmm. I was a critical care nursing sister. And I trained in Aberdeen Royal Infirm and I worked there and then I spent eight years in the army as an army critical care nurse. I came back out and went back into the NHS. So I worked in the NHS, stepped back for eight years, came back into it and went, what the hell happened yeah, here? Happened. Because all of that, that slow degrading of mm. the joined up nature, the strategic mm. nature, the discharge planning. You used to call one person in the local authority yeah. and they would go, oh yes, we have beds here, we have a cottage <coughs> hospital here. Now it's like, no, no, we can't take them. So you call this home and then yeah. you call that and then you call. And there's a reason why that whole system is breaking mm. down. We're relying completely on migrant workers now to fill all of these gaps yeah. with a government that regularly has a, a, a xenophobic seizure and decides we don't want any of you anymore. Yeah. We've no thought to what that means for the people who are working here mm -hmm. and how they're treated and what that means to the gaps they're about to create when they shut the, when they slam the doors closed and go, no, 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 no you no key more. workers are not, you're low skilled now. You were key workers last mm -hmm. week when we had a crisis, you're low skilled now and we don't want you. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the, all these things are very, are very interconnected together, aren't mm. they? Yeah. So we have, we have uh, the parliamentary side of the debate yeah. here. Um, I, I don't need to say much about Richard Bergen. You all know who he is. MP for Leeds East, I believe. Um, was part, key part of Jeremy Corbyn's team, which we all appreciated. Thank you for that. 
Um, and the thing I register most about Richard is whenever there is uh, an important solidarity rally, he is there. Whenever there is a key picket line, he is there. Whenever there's a key issue that we're all sat at home watching the news panic about, feeling that, that fear, what's going to happen when I'm old? What's going to happen with my pension? What's going to happen if I need an ambulance? Richard is there with a really good statement. Irrelevant of whether it gets him into trouble, you're much braver than me. Um, I thank you for being here with us. And I'm particularly interested in your employment law background. I don't know if that will feed in at all to your speech, but I will hand over to you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Cassie. And thanks to everyone here. Thanks to the um, Socialist uh, Health Association. Thanks also to uh, Andrea. Uh, great to see you. Do you want to be in our photo, Andrea? Come on, get, get back on the platform. I think it's, we need a round of applause for the fact that the president of Unison uh, is, uh, is here uh, with us. And it's really important. Yeah, I think we're fine, aren't we? I think it's really important, and Andrea's experience and the workers that Andrea speaks for, that's absolutely uh, vital. I also bring uh, greetings from the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, uh, of whom uh, I'm proud to be uh, Secretary. The Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs uh, really values the work of the Socialist Health Association and look forward to working with you even more closely as there are further and further attacks on our National Health Service. You know better than I do, but I think it's worth recounting that the NHS is in the emergency room, and we need to do everything we can to save it. There's a record 6.7 million people waiting for NHS treatments and waiting longer than ever before, often in pain and often in discomfort. And it's no surprise to you to know that stroke and heart attack victims have been left waiting for 59 minutes for the ambulance on average. And the number of vacant posts across the NHS has reached a staggering record high of over 130,000 vacant posts. That's almost 10% of the planned workforce. Mm -hmm. And so when the NHS faces this crisis, as sure as night follows day, the Tories look for excuses, for explanations. The NHS crisis, the Tories will say, is because of COVID. But we need to be clear that it's Tories, the Tory government, not COVID, that's the cause of the crisis in our National Health Service. <laughs> How appalling to use COVID and all the people who lost their lives uh, in the pandemic so far, to use COVID uh, as a cover. Because of course COVID has made it worse, but the NHS went into the pandemic in a crisis, already in a deep crisis. Before the pandemic, there were record waiting lists of 4.4 million. And these were rising by about 300,000 a year. And the NHS hasn't met the standard for people to be seen within 18 weeks since way back in 2016, well before the pandemic. The A&E standard hasn't been met since July 2015, years before the pandemic, the Tories are the cause of this crisis. Even Nadine Dorries admitted the Conservatives left the health service, and I quote, wanting and inadequate when COVID struck. We need to be clear, the NHS model isn't failing. The NHS is being deliberately failed by this government. And I remember speaking in a debate uh, in Wales, uh, in a past life when I was in the Shadow Cabinet, and in Liz Truss's past life when she wasn't uh, Prime Minister. And she talked in this debate about how the economy should work and what vision we all have for society. She talked about not believing in any interference with the market. And she even referenced healthcare when she was talking about this free market fundamentalism. That's the kind of government that we're dealing with. So this crisis is a result of the policies of the last decade, driven by austerity, driven by cuts, driven by privatisation, by outsourcing, and the disastrous 2012 uh, reforms that marketised our National Health Service. We need to be proud of our NHS and its founding principles, and proud of all the work that our NHS workers do. I often say, and it's true, that the NHS 
is the greatest example in our country's history of socialist principles put into practice. It shows you a different way of running society, a way of running society for people, not for profit. So as well as defending our National Health Service, I think we need to say that other institutions in society, other areas of the economy, should be run along, along the founding principles of our National Health Service that put people and planet before profit. And there are those in powerful positions who see the creation of the NHS, which the Tories, of course, opposed time after time after time again in Parliament. They see the National Health Service as a big mistake. They see it as some kind of Stalinist monolith, which is absolute nonsense. That's how these ideological free market fundamentalists view our wonderful National Health Service. And make no mistake, they want to turn it into an American-style insurance-based healthcare system where they feel for your wallet before they feel for your pulse. We can't allow that to happen because once National Health Service is gone in the form it should be, whatever name it's given, because I'm sure they'll still use the same title as kind of cover. You know, it'll be very hard, much harder to get it back. But we're meeting at a time where for the, all the crisis in the NHS, for all the fact we're told that NHS workers have to accept real-term pay cuts after having it so hard for so long, those at the very top are doing very well indeed. The wealth of British billionaires is increasing by £200 million per day. In a crisis, there are winners and losers, and so too with the NHS in crisis. Uh, energy firms, their energy firms are making £2,000 per second in profit. That's the kind of obscene wealth hoovering up operation that's going up in our society. We've seen a steep rise in self-pay healthcare. According to the Financial Times, personally funded treatment increased by 39% across the UK in the past two years as waiting lists spiral. I go on this uh, GP NHS app on my phone and before I can get to the bit about my own GP and what they offer, it shows me a big long list of all the things that the NHS and the GP doesn't offer that I can pay for if I click on. And not to be a conspiracy theorist because we know how these things work. That's about getting people used to the concepts of seeing that things are charged for, getting people used to the idea, softening them up for paying for this or for that, viewing things as optional extras, trying to whittle down the core service of our National Health Service. So the chief executive of the private health care group, Spire, told the Financial Times um, that we are seeing, and I quote, a fundamental shift in the use of self-pay and describe the demand for care as strong and unprecedented. And this deliberate underfunding of our National Health Service is part of a strategy to accelerate greater privatisation of our NHS. The Tories never let a crisis go to waste. They always use a crisis to try and reshape our public services, reshape our economic model in the interests of the 1%. And with this Reagan-style economics, and Reagan-style politics that Liz Truss is pursuing, I think, and I think we all know, their vision for the United, uh, well, their vision for the National Health Service uh, is a vision from the United uh, States of America. I mean, look what happened with COVID test and trace. The government handed billions of pounds over uh, to line the pockets of Serco and the private companies. That's what the Tories want to do to our whole NHS. There's been a corporate takeover bill, entrenching an even greater role for private companies in our NHS. That was the real aim of the health and care bill. It should really be called, as I say, the NHS corporate takeover bill. Uh, I introduced uh, an amendment to make uh, the NHS the default provider. Sadly, that uh, amendment uh, didn't pass uh, and wasn't agreed to by the government. That's why we need to build the biggest possible mass campaign with our trade unions, with the Socialist Health Association and with the public more widely. You know that the bill opened the door for private corporations to not only profit from people's ill health, but to get to sit on boards and increasingly get to decide who gets what treatment and when. 
They do this through the 42 local health boards, the so-called integrated care boards, which make critical decisions about NHS budgets and services. And at the time, I called it a charter for corruption. Contracts will be awarded to private healthcare providers with even less transparency than before. So how will this work? The NHS bodies will no longer have to put bids out to competitive tender, a move that was long demanded by those opposed to the privatisation of our NHS. But instead of the NHS becoming the default provider, as I proposed through my amendment in Parliament, the bill leaves it wide open that contracts can be awarded to private healthcare providers without considering any other bids. So all of this means that private healthcare providers will have a bigger say and with less <coughs> scrutiny. And so the dodgy allocation of contracts that we saw through COVID risks becoming the new norm. So what should Labour do? We are, after all, at Labour conference. I think that Labour should launch the biggest campaign in our history to save our national health service. Our party has to offer hope. Our party has to show fight. And the answers are relatively simple. A key demand that Labour, our party, should be making is for an unprecedented emergency funding package. Let's bail out the NHS with generosity of tens of billions with which the profits of the oil and gas companies are being bailed out by the latest energy package. Our party, in my view, should be making this a total priority, organising the biggest possible campaign to save our NHS. We need to then make the case passionately that longer term funding has to be driven up. We shouldn't be confusing the debate by saying that money isn't the only part of it is only part of the answer. Now, I'm sorry to say that this line is being used far too much at the moment, in my opinion. Because when you say money is only part of the answer, that creates the wrong context for the debate, uh, doesn't it? A big funding package is the answer. A big funding package is clearly the answer. Under the last Labour government, NHS funding increased by 7% per year. Under the Tories, it increased by just 1.2% per year between 2009-10 and 2018-2019, and by even less when you factor in the growing and ageing population. So as a party, we must commit to a huge year-on-year -year increase. And then we come to the matter of pay. Myself and some other MPs uh, met with the Royal College of Nurses uh, the other day. And we need to pressure the government to address the staffing crisis by backing a just pay deal for NHS staff. That means, quite simply, inflation-proofing pay this year and then a plan to bring pay back up to 2010 levels. Our party should promise it now and our party should campaign to make the government do it now. I mentioned uh, earlier uh, the uh, vacancies being at record highs, and that includes 47,000 nurses, the highest number on record, and it's growing rapidly. This isn't just a numbers game. We're losing tens of thousands of years of nursing experience. At the very moment, we can't afford to lose a single professional, and patients will pay a very heavy price. As I say, this experience takes years and years to build up, and it can't be replaced just like that. We need to bring the NHS back as a full public service. We need to be shouting from the rooftops that we will restore the National Health Service as a full public service. We need to be saying we will kick the private vultures out. We have to be calling out that Tory plan. We have to be making clear that the Tory plan is to underfund our NHS and then to try and help sell it off slice by slice. And why do I say we should put these private vultures on notice that we'll boot them out? Well, one, it's the right thing to do, but also 
by putting them on notice. It helps get in the way of this terrible Tory plan to finish off the privatisation of our National Health Service. We want to make these private companies think twice before they get involved further in this because they need to know that if they do, it's going to cost them dearly. It's going to cost them. It's going to cost them in the pockets. It's going to cost the shareholders. The future's not going to be bright for these private fortunes when it comes to trying to feed off the carcass of our National Health Service. As I say, last year I put down the amendment to make the NHS the default uh, provider. Uh, this should be our manifesto promise. So when you see images of the NHS in crisis, we should remember that over £100 billion of public money has gone to non-NHS providers of healthcare in the last decade alone. That's public money that should have been invested in our National Health Service. And we need to be clear. We need to be clear that a Labour government should introduce a national care service. A national care service built upon the founding principles of our National Health Service and funded through the closing of the lower tax uh, is on, uh, on wealth at the very top. So just to conclude, I am worried. I'm worried about uh, some of the things that I hear being said. You know, I've come to this conference to be constructive, not to criticise, but to propose policies for the party to show the vast majority of people that we, that our party, are on their side. So what I'm about to say, I'm going to say in a comradely way. But the Shadow Health Secretary does need, in my opinion, to stop giving interviews where he flies this kite that the private sector is part of the solution to the NHS crisis. That really does need to stop because it's dangerous. As a party, we shouldn't be promoting conversations about a greater role for the private sector being the solution to the NHS. The private sector is not offering a helping hand. The private sector is trying to get its hands around the throats of our National Health Service. So promoting the idea that it has some kind of role in saving the NHS can only help our enemies who want to see the privatisation of our NHS. We should be talking about more of our services being run in line with the founding principles of our National Health Service. And I know, for some, getting the private sector involved feels superficially attractive, but it's wrong in principle and it's wrong in practice, and we need to be clear about that. As Professor Colin Lays has explained uh, in his talk, uh, he said that talk of the private sector helping the NHS with extra capacity to clear the huge post-COVID backlog of patients waiting for treatment, in fact, conceals a crucial fact. Private hospitals can only do this work by using NHS consultants. The private hospitals themselves have no doctors of their own. So private hospitals rely on NHS staff working outside their NHS hours on a self-employed basis. For example, most private providers don't even employ resident medical officers who care for patients in recovery. They largely use NHS junior doctors employed as short-term agency staff. The private sector does not and cannot plug the gap in NHS services. In fact, it's the other way around. In effect, the NHS is paying private hospitals for the use of otherwise empty beds by NHS patients and paying NHS doctors to treat them rather than pay the same doctors to do the work in NHS facilities. The private sector acts as a parasitic middleman with no real purpose. And we've already seen the private sector fail to prop up the NHS during the pandemic. The government paid private hospitals between 200 and 500 million pounds a month. Yet on 39% of the days from March 2020 to March 2021, no private bed was occupied by a COVID patient. 
and on 20% more days, only one bed was occupied by COVID patients and they performed fewer NHS funded operations than the previous year. And the key reason for this lack of use is that as the NHS deployed its surgeons and clinicians to respond to the emergency, private hospitals did not have enough staff. In other words, the private sector needs the NHS, not the other way around. <laughs> this wasn't a failure for private hospitals, however, because despite underuse, they were guaranteed income and avoided expected losses. So that's the reality of the situation we face. It's often been said that the NHS is in crisis, and it often has been in crisis through its proud history, because the Tories' record on the NHS, whenever they're in government, and they've been in government far too long and far too often uh, since the foundation of our party, is a truly terrible record. But never has the crisis been more urgent. And I do worry that as people face the biggest cost of the emergency that they've faced uh, in living memory, that the Tories will try and think, or think that they can try and push through the final privatisation of our NHS, where everyone's worrying about paying their bills, everyone's worrying about their jobs, everyone's worrying about making ends meet. We can't allow that to happen. We won't allow that to happen. The Socialist Health Association, the trade unions, and Labour MPs, such as those in the Socialist Campaign Group of Labour MPs, need to work together more closely than ever before to win this fight, the most important fight in the history of our NHS since its foundation. Thank you very much. Um, where, I just wanted to ask you, where do you think the big gap is between what we as a, an organisation are talking about in terms of how we would like the NHS to run and where Labour policy currently is? We're, we've all read policy, but um, interpreting Labour policy at the moment is slightly more challenging than it might have been a few years ago in terms of what it actually means. Do you have a a sense beyond what you've said of where our key battlegrounds are? Uh, I think a key battleground is the background I mentioned to try and take out this point from the narrative that somehow the private sector is uh, going to help uh, the NHS in this crisis and is part of the uh, solution because that's a kind of um, opening up the door even further, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and I think one of the reasons that people say this kind of thing is obviously when we've been in opposition uh, for 12 years, people look back to the last time we were in government. And the last time we were in government, uh, the Labour government uh, brought lots of extra funding to mm. our health service, but it also involved the private sector. And because of the kind of uh, ideological discussions um, amongst people um, who were kind of adherents of Tony Giddens's third way, uh, and public-private partnerships and PFI and the rest of it, I think some people are too tempted 20 years later to echo that kind of language. Mm. But as you understand that particularly now in 2022, that that helps those who are seeking to privatise our NHS and finish privatising our NHS. Uh, and so whatever the people who say this in our party intend, uh, inevitably by saying it, it ends up as a kind of wedge uh, through which others will rush through to finish this travesty of fully privatising our National Health Service. Mm, thank you. Um, how much time do you have to hang around with us so we can... I've got to leave at quarter past, I'm reliably told. At quarter past. OK, so if we, if we just take a couple of questions then before we go on to our, our last speaker. Um, I'm, you've got your hand up first, so if I go here and then here. Um, yeah. Um, I want to make a point, we've had 40 years, the context in which we're talking about um, undoing privatisation, we have 40 years, sorry, maybe 30 years of governments that have all been on that side of the fence. And the narratives, and we're talking about so US influence and so on, and, and companies being on boards. Companies have had influence at policy level, and the things that trickle down, let's use that expression, to people who are involved in policy, such as yourself, Chair, um, uh, over all these times. 
they have framed that debate. So I want to put something from when Diana quickly, when she was Shadow Health Secretary, because the only time really since Frank Dobson we've had somebody who was a Shadow Health Secretary who was on the left. She said there's undoubtedly, uh, undoubtedly a case of bringing health and social, state, social care stakeholders together to improve planning and coordination. But the concern is, in reality, the plans from NHS England will be used to force through cuts and close hospitals will make it harder for patients to access face-to-face -face consultations and that's when your app comes in. And we're talking about policy here, not underfunding, creating lack of access to GPs. Deliberate policy creating lack of access to GPs, which enables the kind of office that you find on your, on your phone app. And above all, will open the door to more privatisations. And, and Diane Abbott quoted an NHS England director saying that these plans will bring an enormous opportunity for the private sector. Now, these plans are the thing that NHS England has been doing, which it calls bringing health and social care together, which has been dominant. And how many people are aware that this is what it was called accountable caring organisations a few years ago, because that's the US model? Is, is there a question? There is a question. I'm just conscious of Can we time. oppose that, please? Labour conference, if it votes tomorrow for the Social Health Association um, motion, it will be the fifth year in a row that Labour conference, conference demands that we oppose integrated care systems in themselves and not whether or not there's somebody on the boards because they are incentives to cut away our care. Bringing the budgets together, they give financial rewards to those. That's what it is. And we can, there's lots of evidence for it. It's not talked about a lot. And in ways that benefit the private sector, such as offering things which are no longer in the NHS. So please, 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 can we talk about that on the left uh, and not just, because more funding will go to that and it won't go to bring back our services. Thank you. Shall I take all of them first? Yeah, that's, um, and if we could try and keep it, we, we will, there will be space for like contributions and things towards the end, but we don't often have someone we can quiz and get. You know, my, my favourite, so. this is no criticism of the comrade there, no, it's really no, important no, point you made. But my favourite quote at fringe meetings from the floor, and I've probably been guilty of it myself before I was an MP, is uh, more of a comment than a question, please. Yeah. <laughs> that always means you're for a good time. Uh, we, we do want your comments. I just, yeah. we, we get to quiz him, so if there's specifics, that would be really helpful. Um, you were next, I believe. Uh, hi, thank you, Richard, for your contribution. And um, I just want to introduce myself by saying I was a yeah, private sector social worker and now retired and um, I'm now and have been for six years a, a, a governor of the mental health trust in North London and um, I'm anxious that NHS England controls <coughs> what um, left doctors and administrators want to do so although we put our position to them as users and professionals, we are constantly told, well, yes, we'd like to do that, but NHS England tells us what to do, and we'll lose our jobs if we oppose them. And so what can the social, uh, you know, the um, socialist ca uh, campaign group of MPs do to control NHS England? Should we do one more? Yeah. Uh, then I do nothing. Thank you. Next to get and, and thanks, Pamela, so far. Lovely to hear you again, Richard. I think my thing is about, uh, we've just mentioned about privatisation, and I suppose, again, everybody in uh, Liverpool will forget about privatisation because we've got a PFI, which is a hospital down there mm -hmm. that's lying vacant, that's been lying vacant now for yeah. five years, <coughs> think, maybe. Yeah. But my question is, how do we get the public on board? I mean, it's good. The NHS is the jewel in our crown, mm -hmm. but we seem to have, <coughs> the public are listening about this issue, they can't get a doctor, you can't see anyone, NHS is in crisis, so it's not for you. And we really need, for us to be successful in the social health association, we need to have a public persona mm -hmm. that explains quite simply, just what you were talking about, the amount of money, is that's <coughs> why you're not getting it. And I think that that's my great fear because I think we will lose the NHS, but we need a public, we need public to be on our, our side so they know exactly what's happening to them because they think they've got no control over us. Just like the people who are working in the NHS, but the general public think, and it is ours after all. Thank you. Yeah. I'm not going to take all that there, I'll just let Richard answer and then we'll see how we have, how we're doing time wise. 
And there is an irony, isn't there, to the fact that Labour seems to be giving up this battle yeah. just at the point the public is finally getting what we've been yeah. telling them for 20 years. There is an irony to that. Well, just to quickly uh, answer those uh, questions. Mm -hmm. The first one in relation to uh, integrated systems, you said, mm -hmm. and the Socialist Health Association motion. We'll call them old-fashioned, I think, if uh, motions are passed by a party conference. Will it be, uh, one, year running, one year, two years running or five years running, it should be taken up by the leadership, which is why I want to see the party leader today in his speech at two o'clock uh, talk about his support for the motions passed at conference this year for a £15 an hour minimum wage, for public ownership and for inflation-proofed uh, pay rises. So uh, let's see what happens with that motion tomorrow. If it's, a pass, if it's passed again, uh, it should be uh, honoured. I think it's important in any debate you explain as experts fully uh, what that means, because I'll be honest about it. I didn't quite get all the detail of what you're talking about. Not, not your fault at all, but to a generalist audience, uh, I think it's really important that you explain these things. People look to you as experts who work in the health sector and members of the social health association t t for a lead and for a guide i think so the debates are really important so you can raise awareness um, the second point um what can the social campaign group do to control nhs england well if only we were so powerful <laughs> that we could be controlling nhs england. we can't even control the labor party at the moment but anyway uh step step by step um in terms of what parliament can do i mean you're the expert i'm not but obviously I believe in public ownership and I believe in public ownership of uh, sectors of our society and our economy more widely than the NHS on the basis of the founding principles of the NHS. But I think the type of public ownership is important and the fact it has to be democratic and participatory, whether that be through elected representatives, through workers who work in the sector and also the public as well. So I think... It's important, isn't it, that bureaucracies, I mean, correct me if you think I'm wrong, that unelected bureaucrats, some of whom might not have experience of actually being healthcare workers themselves, uh, making decisions which affect the lives of healthcare workers uh, and the patients and communities. I think as much participation, as much transparency, as much democracy in that as we can have, uh, the better. Then we moved on to a key question uh, from just further back there about how can we get the, uh, the public on board? Well, the opinion polls suggest that the public are uh, on board, but we need to, I think, uh, and the Social Health Association, the trade unions and Labour MPs need to further and deepen the public's understanding of exactly what the threat to our National Health Service is. So we need to work really hard to capture the public imagination with easy to digest campaigns, facts, and slogans so that people understand exactly what's at stake because the NHS has often been said is the most loved institution uh, in our uh, country's history and in our country at the moment and if people when people really understand what the Tories have planned for it and what these private sector vultures have planned for it then people will not only oppose that as they do but people will want to become active in the campaign against that and that's the key thing how do we shift from support for the nhs and opposition to privatization to an active mass movement of the of millions and millions of people in defense of nhs and against privatization that's the key question i don't have all the answers on that but i think that it can only really happen by us all working together can't it the trade unions the social health association and mps and councillors uh, who are up for speaking out about this. Thank you. I know there are more questions, but to it go has gone quarter to pass, and we, we know Richard's uh, time is very busy. So can I have a round of applause? Thank you Thanks very so much. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that, really appreciate it. So we will be moving on to our Thank final you. speaker. So this is where you get to Sorry. hear some of the work um, being done by people who are um, key members care. within the SHA um, and key, key workers um, working with them. Um, we'll also, we'll touch on our motion tomorrow as well, so, so stick around for that so that you can look out for that on the conference floor and listen to the debate for those of you that might have the opportunity to get up there and speak to it. Um, you'll hear a bit um, on that. So, 
Thank you for uh, waiting. Uh, we've left the best till last, because those of you who know uh, Jabu will know she is a bit of a force of nature, both within the SHA, within Oxford City Council, um, and within the trade union movement. Um, Jabu Nala Hartley, um, she grew up in South Africa. Um, her mother was the first black woman general secretary of the MAWU, which was the South Africa's second largest union, so basically the equivalent of Unison in South Africa. So having, um, having grown up around that, as you can imagine, trade union movement, the labor movement and workers' rights is very much um, at her core. Um, she is the chair of the Oxford Living Wage Campaign, and many of you who are in that area will know her from that work. Uh, she's a councillor on Oxford City Council, and has served as vice chair of the health and overview, uh, health and overview scrutiny, o overview scrutiny mm. committee. That's the one. So these are the um, scrutiny committees that are meant to look at all of these. You know how we decide, decide how provision is decided. So if you don't work in the healthcare sector or social care sector, um, essentially these committees look at who's providing what, where they make sure it's all supposedly good value for money. What's working? What's not? Um, and the local authorities are, are meant, to, meant to oversee that. Some of them are excellent and work really well. Some of them are lip service to a whole heap of private providers and they're, they're basically tick boxing some appalling use of our public money. But if you can get on those committees, they're scrappy and hard work, which I, I hope Jabu speaks to a little bit. Um, she is also the founder of Mothers for Justice Ubuntu, which is tackling uh, structural racism within our, our, our criminal justice system which would require some steel, I would imagine, to do that work. So I'm delighted she's with us, and I will hand over to you. Thank you, Kessie, for that introduction. One of the disadvantages of going last is that most of the material <laughs> is gone. <laughs> They've spoken to what I, some of the things that I wanted to talk about. But one of the uh, most uh, important thing is that uh, <clears throat> my fuel for campaigning around the NHS uh, was brought about uh, by understanding the foundations of the NHS in terms of its radical project and, 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 the, and, the, and the ethos of the NHS in terms of the egalitarian system that was supposed to be NHS for all at the point of entry. So the reality is far from that in terms of what this government is doing to our NHS. So uh, prior to the uh, NHS uh, foundation, the public health policy was atrocious in terms of understanding the needs of the working classes who couldn't afford health care. So I am proud to be part of the labor movement which founded that, uh, that historical uh, that historical uh, institution of NHS. So we must defend the NHS. Uh, as uh, Kese said, I'm a councillor, I'm a city councillor in uh, Oxford. Uh, my ward is a uh, button. It's uh, about uh, one mile from the JR hospital where Liz Trust was born. <laughs> yes. The reality is far from uh, the world of Liz Truss. The reality in Batin is that we have a crisis. We have a crisis as we have in all, most of the public services that uh, were, were chopped down during austerity. Batin is facing, uh, like any other cities that are struggling, we're facing one of the worst uh, catastrophe that is going to take place because of the cost of living crisis. People are heavily reliant on uh, food banks. People, uh, there's a high mental health uh, deficit. There's a, there's a high uh, level of poverty, which was uh, featured in Sir Philip Alston, the UN envoys, who came to Barton. We also uh, are struggling with uh, crime in terms of uh, the youth in, in, in Batin. We've had, uh, I think in the last two years, we've had a couple of Section 60s declared in Batin, and uh, we've had murders and stabbings. So that is the kind of area 
that uh, Batsin is, um, is having to deal with. But flipping that, uh, it is one of the most uh, interesting areas in terms of its um, uh, politics. Uh, one of the things that um, I remember campaigning as a councillor was a briefing from our Labour, some of our Labour comrades, who said, uh, if you knock on the doors and they tell you that they are Labour, leave them alone, move on, don't engage them in politics. So with my background, uh, having been raised... <laughs> oh, okay. Having been raised by a trade unionist, one of the most, uh, uh, I would say, one of the most fierce women who challenged the apartheid system in South Africa. <laughs> I decided to flip the script and, uh, and talk to the people of Batin and talk about their problems and understand what is it that uh, uh, they feel politics is... Uh, is, a, is, is, a, is, a, is not rich, is not something that they feel they want to engage in. Uh, yeah, they'll start with the usual, yeah, yeah, you're all the same, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then I say, I'll say something like that, okay, I understand, but let's talk about council tax. Let's talk about housing. Let's talk about poverty. Let's talk about health. Let's talk about crime. By the time I was finished, they'd be saying, we're voting for you. <laughs> The, um, the, the issues that uh, uh, was, w were really prevalent in Batin, beside uh, the crime issues, it's housing, it's poverty. So the, the, the people are starting from, there was a lot of talk about leveling up, leveling up. The people there are really struggling. And uh, Batin being uh, one mile from uh, the JR, most of the workers that you're finding in Batin are working for the NHS. Mm -hmm. And to hear an NHS worker tell you that I have to subsidize my income with a food bank. Mm -hmm. I have to, uh, what you call, I have to come back to a home that is cold after a long shift mm -hmm. at work. It's, it's, it's harrowing. It's, it's, it's absolutely, I mean, uh, I, I'm just thinking of a couple of stories now because a lot of them, because I live there, and my friends. I had a call from a friend who just finished her long shift uh, from a mental health uh, 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 hospital. And she said, Jabu, I've worked so hard that I even forgot to, to text my car. So as she was about to move off, the police got her and said, y y your car is not texted. But because the police also, which we must keep appealing to them, that they are part of our working class people. Mm -hmm. They said to her, okay, park the car here. Go and Go in and text your car and then come back. They didn't, they didn't seize the car, which was really, really a good deed from the police. But these are the things that are facing people. She didn't have the money. She said, Chabu, can you help? I had to help. This is our nurses. This is our nurses. We are having so many crises where people are saying, I, 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 I come back. I don't look forward to my house. Right now, I'm involved in a housing project where we're trying to get the council to expedite the retrofit project so that the people in these council houses can actually uh, uh, get some warmth this winter. It's, the, the crises are huge. So uh, for me, the, um, the drive uh, is not so much about the scrutinies, because when we have the overview scrutiny, we bring the trust, we bring the, we bring the, 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 what, the parasites that are for uh, pr privatization, there's a lot of avoiding of questions. There's a lot of uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, not, not, not caring about what is really happening in terms of the social crisis in our communities. So for me, the campaigning side of it has been uh, embattling and empowering because uh, like uh, I've got Paula here, one of my councillors, we are the seven councillors in, 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 in Oxford that... Uh, <laughs> that are always present at every picket mm -hmm. in Oxford. Yeah. We, began, we began this route uh, around, uh, I'll say, uh, sometime, we were elected in May of 2021, but we have been at every picket. And believe you me, we are even influencing some of the right councillors. Yeah. They are now coming out. 
they are now trying to, you know, be seen with pickets, even though the Labour Party general rule is to not have anyone there. But they are coming out and they are supporting. So, as I said, I, I had a speech here and I've sort of abandoned it because uh, Richard and, 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 and um, Andre have really covered a lot of the areas. But my biggest uh, 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 sort of like energetic uh, way of um, saying to Socialist Health Association is to, we are a socialist movement. You know, we are, um, we are supporting the, the ethos of the NHS. So the, 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 the drive uh, to, 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 to actually build capacity around the socialist health is to bring these areas into our movement, is to actually find more young people to actually, you know, uh, you, know f be, you know, build a movement that can be sustained and can really, you know, be the most powerful thing that once smashed this government, you know. I, you know, I, 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 um, I'm so touched to be here at this conference I have been on a couple of rallies with Enough is Enough and listening to all these wonderful speeches, these uh, inspiring uh, people, what they are doing in terms of driving the, 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 the energy behind the movement to really fight back. Um, it's, 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 it, it reminds me of the days that uh, I was part of the UDF, the United Democratic Front, which smashed apartheid. It was... It was a movement that uh, was so powerful in terms of its, it drew from the students, it drew from the workers, it drew from civic society, it drew, it, 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 apartheid was blindsided. They didn't see what was coming. But more than anything, one of the things that was really, I take back from this uh, Enough is Enough campaign is to see the level of internationalism that has been displayed in terms of of the fight, you know, and 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 and, and, and I lament the, the the destruction of the NHS. The NHS is one of the world's most envied yeah, yeah. system. Yeah. It is powerful, and to actually uh, use an American model to try and smash something that uh, is, is, is so valuable. I think, you know, all of us that are here, we must, we must reach down, we must, we, must, we must continue to mobilize. We must continue to mobilize to fight and defend the NHS. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. joked earlier that we were the sandwich filling because we knew Richard and um, Andrea were here and we would have, we'd fill in the gaps that weren't covered so um, I think there's a really important thing there about the energy you know the, the energy that is out there the campaigning energy that is out there and, and Richard touched earlier on that the NHS is radical it was a yeah. radical organizer and we tend to think of it as this like this old loved trusted you know embedded in an institution that must be protected and conserved like a big old oak tree. And it's not. It is a radical, fundamental organisation and a, a fundamental um, um, representation of what socialism can achieve. Uh, and we need to be a bit better at, um, at promoting that. And one of the things I would say about context this year is I came last year and I was very, very flat by the end of conference last year. I walked into the conference hall twice listened to the chair insulting the members for about 30 seconds and walked out again, you know, and, and, and was just about buoyed up by the fringe, but I, I felt very disillusioned about our direction of travel. I feel the opposite this year, and I feel the opposite despite whatever is happening in the big important hall over there, because if any of you have been to any of the World Transformed events, if any of you have been to those fringe meetings, the energy there, partly the demographic, it's like, look at all these young people that are going to do stuff for, um, but also they don't care about that, they care about the issues. It's like, we're going to fight for what we believe in, you lot can get on board or, you, or not, that's fine, we're going, and, and we need to channel that energy as well. Um, and as we've seen, there are battles being won, 
just not, they might not be being one in that hall, or they might be being one in that hall and discarded, or they might be being one and taken on. Who knows? We will see. We will watch with interest over the, ne the next few months. Um, we have a motion in the hall. Um, tomorrow, I believe it's being debated. Um, Harry, would you like to speak to... Um, is Coral here? Is yeah, there she is. Do you, want to, speak, do you want to speak? Do you want to speak it? Oh no. Would you like? Would you like to speak to it? You should speak to it, and we'll and Harry can back you up yeah, with any um, excess. But. I guess the the, the point that he, uh, Nico asked about was that there's been several years where this motion's been passed. Oh. <laughs> Next one, lovely SHA. Sorry. Yeah. And there's been several years where this motion. Um, for re oh, there you are. Okay. Re for renationalisation has been passed, and I, mean, I know the Labour Party hasn't been in power, but they ha haven't honoured that, as far as I can tell. They haven't done anything to actually promote those ideas. And now, unfortunately, as uh, Richard said, we've had a shadow health secretary who's just yeah. coming out with cliches mm -hmm. that the private sector will help us do this without any... The private sector is already deeply embedded in the NHS, siphoning off billions of pounds worth of stuff in the central or very organisation of the NHS, who gets treatment, what treatment you can have, and then they keep repeating this thing free at the point of use, mm -hmm. which is, not, that's what the Tories say, yeah. and that's what the Tories do, free at the point of use, and then they, he's also said publicly owned, this is going to be my speech tomorrow, he's also said publicly owned, and, um, of course, the NHS brand is publicly owned. It's just that the brand is publicly owned. That's all it is. And behind it, of course, there's all this privatisation. So all that I can see that he has offered in anything that I've read is actually just what the Tories say, mm -hmm. publicly owned, free at the point of use. And so, we, uh, so a really big thing that we have to stress tomorrow, which the um, person who moved the um, social care motion also said it really clearly about public provision. So I'm almost going to um, copy what she said at the end. And um, about, so that's the thing that's missing is public provision. That he never says a word about public provision yeah. because um, otherwise that, and then, you know, it allows, if you ask for public provision, you can't have an ICS. And you can't have a structure there. So that's what I'll be saying tomorrow. Any ideas are welcome. <laughs> I'm conscious of time, so I think probably to, to end on the conversations a bit of it, there was a great question about how do we, how do we, you know, how do we communicate this to the public? Well, the public is getting it. They are getting that this isn't working, but they might not be getting why it isn't working, and that's where we can fill in the gaps, isn't it? Um, we've had a lot of success um, in, in my local town of just saying to people, who owns your GP surgery? Every time they whinge about, I can't get a GP, who owns your GP surgery? Um, they're all, oh, it's NHS. No, but who owns it? Is it still an NHS? Is it owned by a, a small group of local GPs or is there a company behind it? Go and find out. And, and we have the list so we can, if you don't know, I can probably tell you. Um, because they don't realise that the reason the, the call, in, in our case, the reason um, the person they speak to on the phone that can't answer their questions is because it's a call centre in Birmingham that also deals with calls for IT for a banking company alongside GP appointments alongside they don't understand all of that and those conversations the public opinion is turning and they are starting to understand at a point when our political system seems to be giving up a battle they, they could just about win yes uh, I just wanted to say something rather than ask a question but you know it seems to me that um, 40 years ago when the miners struck in 1984 mm -hmm. miners strike um, you know Thatcher said they're the enemy within mm -hmm. and you know all the police force were came out on and you know people were beaten around the head with truncheons who were you know demonstrating <coughs> It's now the NHS that has got public support. I and mean, they recognized this 40 years ago, mm -hmm. that the NHS has got mass public support, and that's why they're attacking it mm -hmm. and taking slices out of it. So I think we have to be prepared for police coming into the NHS, you know, and uh, anybody who wants to defend what is rightfully ours, we own it. 
is going to be under attack, and we need to be prepared for that. That's yeah. all mm -hmm. I can say. Yeah. I have been very distressed. I am a member of the Labour Party, mm -hmm. but I'm actually at the World Transformed rather yeah. than uh, at the Labour Party conference. But I, I have been very distressed that Labour chose to ditch John Ashworth mm -hmm. as Labour, uh, you know, shadow health minister um, for West Streeting. Mm -hmm. Because John Ashworth it appeared to me as I've been going on these demonstrations and things for a very long time, had slowly got, I mean, he didn't start off understanding, but he had got to understand how um, pernicious privatisation was. Mm -hmm. And by the time uh, uh, um, we no longer had a good leader uh, um, in Jeremy, and, and we lost our health secretary, our, our shadow health secretary. And we got West Streeting. Mm -hmm. Now I want to know how I, as a, an ordinary member of the Labour Party, how can I influence this bloke who's been in, put upon us, <laughs> um, a shadow health secretary who appears to know Nothing. not very much? Mm. Um, what is the best strategy mm. for trying to get him to go on a journey, but much quicker than John Ashworth went on mm. his journey? But, but John Ashworth did, did go on a journey mm. and he did change over those years that he was Shadow Health Minister. Mm. But we need West Streeting, if he's going to carry on mm. being, if he's going to be the Health Secretary, if, we, if Labour gets into power, mm. we need to change him. Mm. We need to get mm. through to him. Well, I mean... Do well, we put him in a room and well, not well, let him well, allow him <laughs> to leave until he, you know, he's learned some seminal... Yeah, I mean, I mean, my, my instinctual response to you there is that how we always influence these things with collective voice, yeah. and that's what the SHA is all about, isn't it? It's we're get, coming together with a collective voice to say this is what we want to happen, this is what we believe is is the way forward, and we have a um, professional um, we have a professional backing behind us in our membership, and that we have members from across the health and social care spectrum. Shabu, yeah. would you... Now, uh, I w yeah, what I would like to say to that is that the neoliberalist agenda is very clear. They plan these things, they are, you know, they are very calculating, and the only defense that we have is to unite as workers and fight. That's mm -hmm. the only way we can convince them to actually uh, come to our side. But uh, more than anything, what I want to say is... Um, the strategy that uh, the strategies that we are employing as uh, say Oxford councillors to show up and and, and, and show up at uh, local courses to actually influence uh, policy in terms of the uh, understanding of what is going on with local issues it, it's also a start we also we're not only just uh, sticking to Oxford but we are uh, traveling around say uh, Oxfordshire to actually you know, get more get more people on our side. We don't have a we don't have a choice in this. We are being attacked, mm -hmm. and we need to defend ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, you and next, sir. <clears throat> I am not as optimistic as Maureen here uh, <laughs> about influencing uh, West Streeting. So I, my question is is towards the Socialist Health Association as an organisation, mm -hmm. which is that listening to Richard Bergen, the Labour Party at the moment. Is not, go, is not going to be um, a, a force for, for change that we, mm. that we need. And that the unions, who are uh, very active, the rail workers, the dockers here, mm -hmm. the prospect of the health service workers, that that is going to be the place which is going to put pressure on mm -hmm. whoever yeah. it is. And we need to be out there on the streets. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, we live in Sheffield, and there is a Yorkshire branch of the Socialist Health yeah. Association, but it's completely inactive, hasn't mm. done, contacted us or done anything for mm -hmm. months and months. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into that, but, but it seems to me that the SHA needs to be on the streets. Mm. Are, are they on the streets with their banners, with yes. the flags? <laughs> are, you know, and are they going to be in the next few months mm. when the, all these disputes need to be you know, yeah. coordinated and come together? Because that is the way 
that we're going to make some change. Yeah. Um, yes. Can I quickly respond to that? You can, go I for it. I partly live in Yorkshire, yeah. and my partner is a member in Yorkshire and said exactly the same thing the other day, got nothing from the Yorkshire SHA. Yeah. We have a problem in Greater Manchester with a similar inactive branch. Can I say, if you want to come to Skipton on Saturday, I was inspired by the Enough is Enough rally yeah. on Sunday. While I've been here, I've rung my partner. I'm meeting Brian McDay today, who's a candidate in Skipton, a Labour candidate in Skipton. We're going to organise it, only be small, but we're going to organise a protest mm. on Saturday in Skipton as part of the Enough is Enough. I'm going to speak about the NHS. Mm. Uh, Brian McDay is going to speak, I think, about the budget. We're going to try and get an RMT speaker because they're going to be on strike in Skipton. It's going to be small, but it's something we can do. So if you want to come over to Skipton, not too far away in your Sheffield. You've got one in Sheffield, yeah. So that, you know, we, we, have to have to to, we have to organise these things ourselves. Yeah. 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 And we have to do it whether it's um, Social Health Association or Keep Our Energy in Public or as members of the Labour Party and or as members of trade unions. That's what we can do and we need to get onto yeah. these. The branches of the SHO that are not active, we need to organise and win them back. Um, on a practical note, if we, um, thank you. If we need to stop filming, that's fine. Um, we, we won't carry on for a few more minutes, but if, you, if we, we might stop the broadcast at that point just because we're in transition. Um, yes, what I would say is if you'd read, read the minutes from the, the minutes that come out from the Central Council meeting, you'd have seen one of the things we put a call out for is that anyone whose branch isn't being active at the minute, where you're not getting a response from branch secretaries or chairs to contact me directly, and I'm correlating that so we can, we can look at, you know, we have branches that are doing amazing jobs and are out on the streets and regularly, and as an SHA we've signed up to the S. Uh, SOS NHS campaign, so that's where a lot of the big push events are happening, but we do register it's a bit geographically disparate at the moment as to how that's operating. So please do read the minutes that come out from the yeah, Central Council meeting. do not mean mm. that members of the Social Health Association are inactive. Absolutely not, and, and not, I know you're they, often they are. are. Jack and yeah. I and lots of people in Sheffield are defending the NHS, but we're not doing it under the banner of the yeah. Socialist Health Association. We're yeah. doing it under Keep Our NHS Public or yeah. Sheffield Save Our NHS or whatever. And, th and that's part of the problem with the NHS. There are loads and loads of people doing loads and loads of things about the NHS, but they're doing them under, under different, different banners. banners. But that, that is what the SOS NHS campaign is all about, is about starting to do that. So I, I hear your frustration, and we have covered that in quite a lot of detail in Central yeah. Council meetings. So do, please do read those minutes, because it does tell you all the things we're trying to do to, to, to deal with the logistics. We had it difficult for years, and we're up and running again now, but it takes a while to get momentum to, to get out everywhere. And there was one more question, and then we're going to um, round up. Sorry, it was a gentleman in front, sorry. Yeah, I, I think... Uh um, Richard asked a uh, personal question in terms of um, we have public support, but how do we convert that into a campaign? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, the, the, the NHS is, is unique, isn't it? If, if, if it is rail, then really it's only the rail workers through their trade unions who can organise and, and defend that. And that, ha that needs to happen in, in the NHS. But there's been a, a very mixed history uh, over many decades in the NHS about workers organising. Mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, and, and the struggles that they've had there. So the, the, the additional uh, struggles that are taking place, trade union disputes, are, are to be welcomed, and, and yes, we yeah. should support those, as has been said from the, from the platform. But converting that, that issue of the, of the public support, which in itself will, will never win the issue um, uh, in its own right. But I think, I think Richard's speech was, was a particular case in point, and Coral said that she, she'll use it. She's going to use a number of speeches. I don't think they'll give you enough time to yes. on my conference floor to say it all. So you'll, have, you'll have to be selective. But, I will. But, but Richard's was very good um, for the layperson. I mean, it was clearly a well-researched speech. There was a lot, of, a lot of factual information. But those of us who, who've been in the NHS for decades often get, get lost in the complexity of it. Mm. And you try to explain something to somebody, and you, and you just go down a rabbit hole because, yeah. because it is so complex. And, and when we start talking about social care, it becomes even more complex, bringing, bringing the two together, as, as mm. being discussed. But I do think that Richard's, Richard's speech, um, and Andrea's, 
Andrea's, not to forget Andrea's description of, her, of that personal experience mm. of, of social care, were so powerful that there's enough material there to, you know, for a, for a campaign for the next 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. Um, thank, I'm sorry we can't do more. Um, do come back for the, there is a second event this afternoon. The flyers are out there. Um, I really appreciate all of, your, all of your time. And for those of you that are SHA members or just interested, can I please just reiterate, please do follow all our social media things. Please do open the email attachments and read the work that it's doing. Uh, we all feel there should be more happening and, and you know, feel that frustration, but there is actually a lot happening. And the more it's amplified by our members, then, then you know, the, more, the more traction we get. Um, and I think you've all, I'm sure every one of you has had that experience of walking into a meeting going, why is nothing happening on X? And you go, we just spent 100 hours organizing. A, it happened last Saturday. It was all over. And what, why were you not reading those things? So please do engage with all of that, because there is a lot of excellent work going on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do join the SHA if you're not a member of the SHA. There's a little code on the bottom.